I feel like the number of terms like that floating around these days, including institutional racism, what is racism, what the hell is anti-racism, more of those terms are floating around, making it hard for us to talk to each other now than before. But as a linguist, I know that very often something that's bothering you seems like it just started last week when really it's been going on forever. Was it like this in the 80s? Hi there, everybody. This is Glenn Lowry. You've tuned into The Glenn Show. I'm with John McWhorter, my conversation partner. We talk every other week. We missed last week because of some exigencies, but we're back and we will be back on a bi-weekly schedule going forward from this point. I teach at Brown University and I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. John teaches at Columbia and he writes for the New York Times. The Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York City sponsors The Glenn Show, for which I am very grateful. So welcome to The Glenn Show, and welcome back, John. Thank you, Glenn. Good to be here. I should tell everybody that my um, audio is not going to be what it usually is because I do not have a microphone. I am coming to you from Key West, and I neglected to bring that piece of equipment. And so hopefully this will not interfere with the procedure. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, maybe the quality... The, the timber of your voice would not be quite so resonant as it ordinarily <laughs> would be, but my timber will make up the difference. <laughs> so that you win. Right. <laughs> so where are you, John? Uh, are you are prepared to say? Are you at some kind of uh, hideaway somewhere? Oh, like why? No, I'm <laughs> at a very nice rental property in Key West that some friends of mine spent the winter at. I guess you could say it's a verb. They winter here. And so me and my girls are here for a short spell and it is, um, the weather is spectacular and it's a lot quieter than Queens or (laughs) Upper West Side. So yeah, I needed this. I'm, I'm beginning to lose my love of the clatter, the, the crabby hustle of New York City. I'm beginning to really value quieter places. So yes, that is where I am. Key West, Florida, the infamous state of Florida where Ron DeSantis is governor and where don't say gay is the order of the day. (laughs) Is there any political uh, aspect to your choice of uh, of, a vacation spot? (laughs) No, it's just that- Is that an endorsement? No. You know that actually in the time I've been here, I have twice just on the street overheard him called a pussy. (laughs) <laughs> it's very interesting, but uh, DeSantis. But um, no, it's just that I'm not sure if that's criticism from the right, from a Trump supporter, or from the left. <laughs> it, it could be. I suspect here it would be the left. But no, my friends are here yeah. essentially for accidental reasons that go back a long, long time. So I'm just in Florida. I haven't been to Florida for a very long time, and so yeah, palm trees, and for some reason, roosters are running around in the street in Key West. Lots of roosters yelling. It's a very interesting place. Now, you are, among other things, a culture critic. You sometimes write about uh, movies and books and plays and operas and whatnot in your uh, New York Times column. Um, What'd you make of the Oscars? Glenn, honestly, I have a quirk. And this this is not about attitude. It's not about criticism. Awards ceremonies have never moved me. I have never cared about the Oscars or the Grammys, even with theater. The Tonys. The idea of there being one thing chosen as the best for often rather loaded reasons. I just don't follow. And I know that makes me kind of boring. This is not elitism. It's not that I think there's something wrong with the Oscars. But I would just rather be doing something else. I just... I, I... It would give me things to write about, I know, but I've just never been able to get into those ceremonies somehow. Do you? Well, no, I mean, because it's interminable. Um, The three or four things I'm interested in, best film, best actor, best supporting actor, actress, et cetera, uh, you know, you have to watch forever in order to to see what those awards, and you can just go online and find out in five minutes after the whole thing is over. I stopped thinking that the MCs, it was Jimmy Kimmel this time, 
were funny a long time ago. And no disrespect intended to Kimball, uh, Kimmel. I didn't see him, so he might have been very funny. But, you know, the last few times that I've bothered to watch even 30 minutes of it, I haven't been laughing like I wanted to be laughing. It is a spectacle. I mean, you see all these uh, beautiful people in their regalia. It's an event uh, for this industry, which is a big part of American cultural life. So um, there's that. I didn't have deep feelings about, you know, Oppenheimer versus Barbie, you know, for Best Picture and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I watched for a while. I DVR'd it, you know, to, in case I wanted to go back later. My lovely wife, Lawan, had a couple of musical performances because she's a big music person that she wanted to see. So we have it recorded, but it's like, what, three hours? I mean, you know. Yeah, I guess so, also something you're supposed to be interested in is is the dresses. And I just... I just I don't care about the dresses or you you'll see them, you know, by accident online the next day. I've never been somebody who was much into finery, even putting it on myself. My mother, my mother had a bohemian streak. And I think one thing that I inherited from her is that I've never been much for wearing suits and jackets and things. I, I do it when I have to. And so that's a, that's another thing. Seeing what what Jennifer Aniston or, you know, Margot Robbie Wearing, I don't, I don't know. I would rather have seen the movie. You know, I saw Barbie. I found it very interesting. And so, yeah, I'm, yeah, Barbie was great. I'm just, um, I'm a, I'm a, uh, what is it? I'm a stiff on that sort of thing. But yeah, so I wish I had more to to say. The movies I found more interesting than that. So Oppenheimer, Barbie, and then American Fiction. Have we talked about American Fiction? No, we haven't talked about American Fiction, and I think we both seen it. I hadn't seen it at, at the last time it came up between us. What'd you think? Um, I I loved it. I thought um, the idea that the white public would go crazy about a cartoonishly ghetto book, I think it's a little outdated. I can imagine that happening in 1995. I don't think it would happen now, but then the book is 20 years old. And it's making a certain point. And one point that you see is, say, for example, that white director at the end who's practically getting off on the idea of a black man getting shot that reflects a sentiment you know in in exaggeration among many white people who consider themselves hit to a certain gospel that that needed to be shown and um i also like that it showed sides of blackness that you don't often see so for example these are black people where money is not an issue you know, they're not super yeah. rich, but money's not an issue. They have second homes. And more to the point, I liked that you saw that they had conflicts and that the conflicts were about what kind of people they were. It wasn't about racism. It wasn't about somebody yeah. who doesn't have enough money or maybe that was only one of the issues. It was that they are individuals with problems, including a mother who is not roly-poly and warm and working class, but is really not a very nice lady to her own kids. Black mothers like that exist just as well as white ones. And I thought, you need to see this individuality. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I don't really care about whether I or not I you... see myself in the movies. But it was kind of interesting to see a character who was that close to me. I, I thought it was... A, he's... Well, I was going to say, I did, I did see you in the movie. And I thought of you, <laughs> there's a scene where he goes into a bookstore looking for his book. Yeah. He finds his book in the section of Black Books. <laughs> he says, the only thing black about my book is that I'm black. That's the only thing that's black about my book. He grabs his books off the shelf and physically moves them out of the black book section. <laughs> the poor attendant says, they're just going to put it back. He says, I don't care. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that happened, that happened to me. And um, I didn't bother to move the books. But yeah, that's real. That's definitely, that's definitely real. And um, And, you know, other things like, the, are we supposed to use this word anymore? N nanny made that character. The way they show she has an arc, that she has a love life and that she gets married, you know, very early. Here's this woman. And, you know, she's a woman of a certain size. And, you know, she, nobody would look at her and say, oh, a great beauty. And you kind of think she's just going to be on the side. But then very quickly they show that a man is interested in her, who she knew a while ago. And they end up getting married and having a lovely wedding. That I thought was nice. Because again, it's real. That happens in, in real life. Whereas in any other movie, 
I'm not going to pretend it's 1950, but that character will be standing on the side, making little comments and probably somewhere near the end saying something wise to the character who was having the most problems. That is not what they did with that character. I liked that. That was a good, that was a good touch. I see that as connected to your first observation when you said this is a family that's got a place on Martha's Vineyard or wherever, uh, where the, there are three children, two of them are physicians and one of them is a professor in the university. Um, and although money is running out because mama's right. going to have to be taken care of and, you know, somebody's got to pay the piper on that and it's not, you know, you know, home care is not, not cheap. Mm -hmm. But um, but they do have a nanny. I think you can say nanny. They they have a a, a lady who's uh, you know been there when they were kids. Has been there right. for you know twenty five thirty years with this family. Loves the kids. They love her. Kids are all adults, um, and they humanize her. And I think you have to humanize. I mean, you got black help in a which is in an a interesting touch. Yeah. Rich black family. Yeah, they they can't be diffident and 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 distant from her and. You know, no. they, there's got to be something real there. Otherwise, yeah. it, yeah. And I, I don't say that that's a phony thing either. I think that we wealthy black people do have a sense in which to help uh, our people, too. They're not just functionaries that we pay to carry our stuff to the laundry. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that character could have been a Latina or something. But instead, it was a, a black woman. That was a, that's a choice. And they they actually did did things with her. I thought that was um I thought that was a nice it was um what was the other thing in it the um the white student who has more of a problem with the n-word than he does i like that one too because that's frankly exactly how i feel i've never had a confrontation like that but it'll probably happen next week and yeah that's that is a real thing at this point that that girl thinks of it as this magic word so that you can't even refer to it and i frankly think that's ridiculous and i feel infantilized by the idea that there could be a word that's supposed to make me so upset. And, you know, there's there's nobody to appeal to. You know, when that happens, basically he is, you know, asked to cool his jets and to, to what is it? He's supposed to go on a sabbatical or something. And because other things like that. She happen. walks out of his classroom. He writes the N-word on the blackboard. And he, she walks out of his classroom and complains to the authorities, and they suggest that it would be a good time for him to take a, Leave of absence. Leave. Yeah. Uh, leave of absence to, until things cool down a little bit because of the furor over his inappropriate context as a black man mm -hmm. <laughs> use of the word, you know. And it's one of those things where but, the movie shows it more effectively than, say, an editorial about it would, because you see the white girl and how earnest she is. Then you see him, and I think frankly, most people watching that would see that there's nothing wrong with him on this, that he's the one who's making sense. It's just that he's stuck in about 1995. And yes, I'm, I agree with him completely. But to see how that exchange plays out shows yeah. how far we've gone in what I think is a useless direction on that word. It reminds me of that scene in that great film, is it called Her? The one about the a woman, uh, maestro, con master conductor. And, Tar. And, uh, Tar. Tar, yeah. Tar, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, there's a scene in there where uh, she's trying to uh, do Bach. Mm -hmm. She wants to do Bach, and she thinks Bach is worth our attention. She thinks there's something in Bach. And this kid's saying, oh, man, that is so old. That is so dead white male. I can't be bothered with it. And, uh, you know, she, she dismisses him very, very effectively. I longed for a disquisition. I know it probably spoiled the movie, but I longed for uh, the main character, the black professor to hold forth at some length True, about yeah. why it was yeah. that this was not where you wanted to, you know, plant your flag in terms of racial justice. It was silly <laughs> and inhibited a genuinely effective examination of the liter literary canon, which is what he was dealing with. Yeah. And instead they cut the scene after she says, well, I don't. And next thing you know, he's being, you know, called to the authorities. Yeah. It would have been better if there weren't an extra couple minutes in there where he said some things. At least I, I kind of missed that too. Yeah. I wonder if that's in the book. The book apparently is rather different. And I keep reminding myself to actually take a look at it. Apparently there are all sorts of things that the movie had to leave out or did leave out. The book is apparently meaner. 
So I don't need to tell you how complicated this year is going to be for our country. Now more than ever, we need to see things clearly and to think for ourselves. That's why I've been using Ground News. It's a website and app that makes it easier to stay informed and not to get trapped in an echo chamber. Thanks to Ground News, I get news I would have otherwise missed, and not from one source, but from a variety of sources across the political spectrum. With each news story, I get a visual breakdown of the outlets that reported on it, their bias, their track record on staying true to the facts, and who owns them. Let's take this story as an example. Supreme Court wary of restricting government contact with social media platforms in free speech case. On Ground News, I can see this story has been covered by 99 sources, 32% of which lean left and 20% lean right. If you look at the summary below the headline, you'll get a quick rundown on what each side emphasizes. If you click the Bias Insights tab, you'll see the main differences in how they tell the story. In this case, the left details preceding court opinions and accentuates the Biden administration's stance. The right is more even-handed in their reporting. They examine claims of conservative speech suppression, but also offer the Biden administration's rebuttal. Ground News keeps me more engaged with the news and introduces me to diverse sources of information spanning the entire political spectrum. Frankly, I think it makes me a better citizen, and I think we all need to work on that to get through 2024 in one piece. If you subscribe right now, you'll get 40% off their Vantage plan, which gives you unlimited access to all their features for about $5 a month. This offer is only available through my link. So go to ground.news slash Glenshow or click the link in the video description. Join me in supporting an independent platform trying to make the news more transparent and accountable. Now, this is not uh, the Oscars. Uh, but it is a film. Did you see the Netflix uh, biopic, Rustin? Yes. What do you think? You're not supposed to say this, given that it's about him. And of course, there's some good acting. But who who am I about to offend? Because I suppose we're going to hear from him. I thought it was really bad. I really, hmm. I really... It was like an ABC after school special, the way it telegraphed and had people sitting around making speeches. I felt like I was being taught. And, um, yeah, I real, I, things like King at the end of the March on Washington turning and giving that fond, acknowledging look to Rustin. One, that probably didn't happen. Two, if it did, the no, look wasn't that long. <laughs> Three, it's something from <laughs> some after school special. And there were a lot of things like that. I thought the casting of Chris Rock as Roy Wilkins was ridiculous. Rock did not do as bad a job as I thought he would, except in one scene where he slipped in those little intonations of his that Wilkins would never have dreamed of expressing himself in. But why him? You know, why put a strange Afro wig on him? Get somebody like Jeffrey Wright who's Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was dead on. Wright isn't as tall as, as Adam was, but that's the first time I've ever seen anybody get him right down to the voice. Clearly, he looked at some, some footage. No, I didn't like it. And I found it, it was a little reductive of what Rustin was all about. Rustin put together the March on Washington. He wasn't allowed to be up front in it because he was gay. Isn't it interesting that he was gay? And you know, these days, that's less interesting than it would have been, say, 30 to 40 years ago. And Rustin was more. What happened to him before? What happened to him after? I found it small, to be honest. What did you think? Now, you got me um, agreeing with you. I'm not in my head over here. I think you just said it better than I'd even thought it in my own mind. I knew I was disquieted. It, Executive producers, Barack and Michelle Obama. Um, it's a political vehicle. They're trying to, you know, structure how we're going to narrate the history of the civil rights movement and uh, Rustin's role in it. Um, there are certain themes, you know, uh, the activists in the streets versus the people who want to march, you know, this kind of thing. And they, they have to 
they, they avoid the complexity of Rustin. I mean, I kept thinking, wasn't this the Bayard Rustin who, after the uh, 1973 uh, uh, Israeli uh, Arab War, um, uh, the Yom Kippur War, uh, didn't he form an organization called Black Americans Support for Israel Committee? That was the Bayard Rustin. Didn't the Bayard Rustin that I recall, right, in 1965 in Commentary Magazine where Norman Podhoritz, the notorious neoconservative, was editor, an essay called From Protest to Politics in which he said, it's time to get out of the streets and start work and get out of the race business and start building working class coalitions that can develop a genuine. I saw none of that. That in essay there. is my favorite thought, thing about it. Yeah, exactly. And I thought on the homosexual thing, I said, yeah, okay. True enough. I mean, and it was scandalous and we live in a different era now and it, and it, it wasn't an important part of, of his life story, but, and they, they, you know, it would have been wrong for them to have whitewashed that. Yeah. On the other hand, they they leaned into it. Yeah, man. yeah. They, they, you know this this kind of affair that he's having with the um, the young with the, uh, amb- ambitious, you know, young, very attractive man and very talented preacher uh, who's about to take over a big church somewhere. You know, he's in his thirties or whatever it is, and and uh, he and uh, Rustin have a thing. They play the hell out of that drum. They 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 beat that drum. Uh, and to what, know, to, to an, what to end? an excess. Yeah, and to what end? Well, to the end of we live in 2024, and that's, <laughs> you know, the sensibility of the audience in 2024. But, I, you know, yeah. uh, I don't know how uh, central it is to the story of, of Rustin. But, I, you know, that's going to seem Or, you know, like another thing is, if you're going to pick him, if you're going to dwell so much on that, these, these assignations and him and the white guy who he was involved with, he resents that. That he can't make a commitment. Why not stretch it out to the end of his life? Late in his life, he actually found a stable relationship. They do that with just a, some writing at the end. But why not make it a, yeah. a, a longer movie and do the man rather than just that one thing he did the March on Washington? It was like a Black History flashcard. I just it, it wasn't. There were some good things in it, but and a lot of and that, that partner at the end is a is a young white guy. Yeah, yeah, and it, it you know. I mean, you mean? Oh, you mean I didn't hear because air conditioning came on. You mean the person who he no, wound I, up? I with? just yeah, exactly. yeah. Who mean yeah, yeah. So yeah, I didn't like you know. Okay. That's actually, Rustin and um, Maestro, uh, Leonard Bernstein, make the same mistake, taking two very large, interesting people who lived at really interesting times, and being much more fascinated with the fact that it was harder to be gay when they lived than it is now. And you end up making the whole movie about that. And so with Bernstein, you don't really learn anything about his music. And you miss that he really created West Side Story. You miss the wonderful night, the radical chic night that Tom Wolf skewered, where the Bernsteins had the Black Panthers in their apartment. There's a whole scene that, you know, they don't, they don't show it in the movie at all. We're supposed to be interested in the fact that he liked guys. That's a reductive. And nobody will make a, a biopic of Bernstein again. That's the only one that we'll ever have. Same thing with Rustin. There's just more. I hope somebody does a play, at least, where they, they do the man. But They don't do the music. I haven't seen Maestro. The music is in it, but it's, it's considered a, a, a sideline in his life, basically. But that was his genius. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And instead, it's all about how his wife doesn't like that he's a little too obvious about being gay and she her. That's that's not it, the life. That's just what somebody now finds fascinating for their own reasons, and that's all that they'll ever be. Great prosthesis. I mean, the really, really, the Bradley Cooper looks just like Bernstein, but that's not enough. So, so, what are you writing about of late uh, in your column at the New York Times? Forgive me for not being on top of everything you do. No, no. Um, I have to work to recall sometimes myself. What did? Yes, um, last week was um, the SAT is not racist, as they called it. And what I what I mean by that is that I love seeing these schools one by one the dominoes falling, letting go of this idea that it's good for black people to not require the SAT or to not take it in the admissions process. Because 
I have always found that condescending. And as evidence has mounted that if you don't use the SAT or similar standardized tests, you are missing diamonds in the rough who otherwise would be admitted to schools. It's become clear that this 2020, 2021 notion that the good thing to do to atone for George Floyd is to not force black people to take standardized tests. That that's going by the wayside. We're beginning to say that there was peak woke and that was in the past. Thank God. Sean Bylock at Dark is the person who created that. And I think that people are following. MIG had done it before, but people are following in her lead. And I said in my piece, she's the anti-racist of 2024 at this point. I think it's a heroic thing that she did. Very important. Oh, wow. So that's, I'm sorry I missed the piece. So I, I wrote that one. And honestly, Glenn, I'm trying to remember the one I did before. Uh, well, I remember one about don't end sentences with a preposition a being one. a silly rule. Yes, that was the <laughs> one before. Boy, that one got around. I was, to be honest with that one, there was nothing I found terribly interesting that week. And so I just decided, let's do, let's do the prepositions. And people seem to really want to hear that. So that was a, that was a fun one to write because that rule has no basis in any kind of scientific or even aesthetic reality. And yet there's still people writing, generally crotchety people of the male gender who say that that's the way they were taught it. And they think that sentences are just better without the preposition at the end, but they can't, they can't defend it. It's just this silly salt throwing over the shoulder idea. So here we are. Don't tell me you're one well, of those I have you here as an expert on language. So let me ask this question because my, here's my gut. My gut is People are trying to communicate when they open their mouths and they make these sounds. That's what's going on. They're trying to communicate with one another. The rules are, should not be fetishized. They, they, they should not be. It's the communication that matters. This idea about he doesn't speak proper English. Well, did you understand what he was trying to tell you? I mean, come back in 20 years and, you know, everybody will be talking like that. What do you mean proper? I mean, so, you know, the fetishization of the rules misses the whole point of language. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. And of course, sometimes there are aesthetic concerns, but with the preposition rule, it has nothing to do with aesthetics. The person with whom I came, the person I came with. Why is the second one not as pretty? It's not about clarity. It's not that if I say the person I came with, you don't quite know what I mean, like you, you were saying. It just makes no, no blessed sense. And if you had no trouble understanding and there's no aesthetic argument, then why keep a rule that's based on some people in stockings 250 years ago who thought English grammar should be as much like Latin as possible? That was a cute notion they had. Just like today's notion that if you make a biopic about somebody who was gay, the movie has to be all about their homosexuality than what they were actually <laughs> interesting for. Same thing. And so, yeah, I say, I say no. And I'm not original on this. Linguists have been arguing this forever. But, yeah. you know, you have to repeat things like Madison Avenue. You can't just say it once. So I said it more. So, so you feel the same way about split infinitives? Split infinitives is equally absurd, exact same thing. In Latin, you don't split the yeah. infinitive because it's one word. In English, they're two yeah. words, so you split them. Yeah, it's, a, it's an utter absurdity. Utter. Yeah. We so, boldly go where no man has gone before. Is that not clear? Something wrong with it? It's ridiculous. I just split an infinitive. To go boldly. To go boldly. See, that's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I don't think it's as good either. Uh, so, uh, you said something about colorblindness. What did you say we were reviewing what we might talk about? We have so many words. What do you want to say about colorblindness? Colorblindness. Um, we have words these days that we can't use clearly. Like, it's, it happened with critical race theory. I'm beginning to have a large statement about this. Now it's DEI. I'm sure that you, like me, every 10 minutes are being asked to participate in something where you address DEI. And CRT, DEI. And like, what? Yeah. What are you, do you mean affirmative action? Do you mean programs designed to diversify uh, an organization? What do we mean? And people mean different things. Actually, Glenn, I want to ask you something. You're in a better position to know this than me. I feel like the number of terms like that floating around these days, including institutional racism, what is racism, what the hell is anti-racism, 
more of those terms are floating around, making it hard for us to talk to each other now than before. But as a linguist, I know that very often something that's bothering you seems like it just started last week when really it's been going on forever. Was it like this in the 80s? And I just wasn't there to notice it because I was in college. Do you sense that getting worse? And of course, you might I'd say no. Well, I, I think if I understand what you're talking about, which is um, stereo, it's a kind of stereotyping. So, because uh, because we are identifying the enemy. The enemy are, if uh, I'm on the critical side of the diversity, equity, and inclusion movement, someone who didn't like Claudine Gay and was happy to see her fired at Harvard, or someone who doesn't like uh, all the affirmative action emphasis that in you know uh, universities and whatever. I say DEI almost with a sneer, you know, the, the way my friend Amy Wax would Ugh. say it, <laughs> with her lip oh, curly, yeah. you know, and you're, you're categorizing a whole, you know, swath of sensibility in the American intellectual spectrum. You have to have a word for it before you dismiss it a little bit like the way people would use socialist or communist as yeah. a derogatory uh, label you want once you slap that label on and we can move on to the next thing we know what we're dealing with they're the enemy and and you know whatever or on the left the way that people talk about empire you know how they say american empire how cornell west or somebody you know wants to dismiss the entirety of the u.s global right. uh, uh, ambition and 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 footprint as uh, an imperial imposition upon what otherwise would have been a pristine global also you know, so they, colonization. They have a, yeah yeah i mean yeah it, that of late, mm-hmm. uh, as given the campus as a site of the conflict within American culture and politics about uh, support for Israel, <clears throat> which the Democrats are learning about because of you know the uh, uh, what do they call it um, um, non-committed vote in the in the primaries oh. where you know some people have called you know genocide Joe where <clears throat> people are showing up right. at whatever. who are those people? Well, they're the DEI, CRT advocates. They're the, the, the left, the the left is also kind of a, a trope. You know, it's meant when it's used like that, you can almost guarantee that the speaker is trying to dismiss a whole category of thought with a, with a single swipe. Right. Um, and, I can't say whether it's more now than it was 30 or 40 years ago. It does feel like it, though, uh, doesn't it? Um, it does. I mean, we live in an era where hashtags can become a thing. You know, Black Lives Matter is an organization and, quote, unquote, a movement, but it begins as a verbal tick. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I mean, in, a shorthand way. I mean, yeah. in particular, that we can't even, well, no, you, you get me. It, it, we can't even be sure what we mean by these terms. You know, DEI in itself, the first thing I think of is some people sitting at a table in some corporation and wanting to get the word out that you know, Black people and Latino and Native American people are welcome to apply, et cetera, et cetera. And then when people dismiss DEI in that, say, Amy Wax way, a lot of people on the left, here I go, pretend, I think, to think that what she's uh, opposed to is fanning out and trying to diversify a group of people just in that kind of anodyne way, as opposed to the harms that the whole racial preference culture can create, all of which I'm very aware of, can't stand myself. But they pretend that DEI only means what it meant for the first 10 minutes. Or do they really not understand that DEI refers to that Claudine Gaze being appointed in that very high position was perhaps a questionable move and was not based on notions of merit that most of us are familiar with. That's the the sort of thing that I mean. It's very hard to talk about these things with clarity. So Christopher Rufo doesn't like DEI. Does that mean that he doesn't like diversity, equity, and inclusion? Of course not. He doesn't like that it has a way of mission creeping into making Claudine Gay the president of Harvard. I just, I'm I'm frustrated with it. Anyway, colorblindness. What do we mean by yeah, that? Which is another example. I just want to be clear. Yeah. You're offering that as another example of one of these tropes. Yeah. What What do we mean by colorblindness? And so if Coleman Hughes, in his book, which I recommend, is um, arguing... The End of Race Politics, 
Arguments for a Colorblind America. That's right. Coleman's book. And Coleman is you know, instantly told, how can we be colorblind when there's racism? And Coleman says, well, you know, of course, racism exists and I revile it. And where it's there, we have to battle it. But the goal is to get to the point of colorblindness. But it's so hard to use the term colorblind in our current culture because people will always jump to the conclusion that what he's saying is, let's pretend race doesn't exist. Now, that's a position right. that some people would defend, but it's not the one that, that Coleman is making. And therefore, the term right. worries me because it creates instant confusion and you have to spend most of your time cutting with a machete through all those weeds before you can say anything interesting. It's just a term that I find awkward and I'm not knocking Coleman's thoughts or his book, but it, it's one of those terms that's hard to use these days. So I have a suggestion for a column that you could write. Easy for me to say. Thank you. So you could take colorblindness as one and you could take um, structural racism as the other. You could say colorblindness is the trope du jour favored by those who are critics of the uh, Ibram X. Kendi's and the Angelo, uh, the uh, Robin D'Angelo's of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they talk about colorblindness and you could take uh, institutional racism as the the trope of uh, favorite trope of the uh, anti-racist activists like Ibram X. Kendi and uh, Robin D'Angelo and my colleague Tricia Rose and our friend Tana Hussey Coates and all those people. Nicole Hannah Jones, let's not leave her out. Um, and in both cases, it's not entirely clear what people are talking about. I mean, a little bit more precision would be helpful. So on institutional racism, of course, every time you see a disparity by race doesn't mean that there is some evil force in the world that has produced it. So what are you talking about specifically? Um, and with respect to colorblindness, no, of course, you don't mean literally not seeing color. So what exactly are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Now, I think the stakes here are, are pretty high. I think they were illustrated by the uh, contest or conflict between Justice Clarence Thomas and Justice Katanji Brown Jackson over the student for fair admissions case, where Thomas is basically saying the Constitution is colorblind. You know, and he's saying the 14th Amendment and he's got his exegesis and I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying that's what he's saying. And uh, Justice Jackson is saying the country is not colorblind by a long shot. And it seems to me they're like talking past each other. Yes. There. Yes. You know. Or is it that Justice Thomas has a higher wisdom that we muddling around down here dealing with the real world can't quite see? Because we have to be open to that. The Constitution is colorblind and therefore knock all this stuff off. Even if the world isn't colorblind, that's where we need to go. Right. Or, and that's I'm what inclined saying. that that I'm not inclined there, but you can't dismiss it out of hand. But then, what does what does Justice Brown mean, and um, Jackson mean, and yeah, yeah, life isn't colorblind, but what do you do about that? Yeah, how do you, that, that this stuff is really hard. They're not talking about the same thing exactly, and it frustrates me. So I'm teaching this in in this undergraduate course I'm teaching right now on race, and we're going over the uh, court's decisions last uh, summer in the. Uh, uh, students for Fair Admissions Affirmative Action case. And I must say, I have more than a little sympathy for, it won't surprise anybody, Justice Thomas's position, which is the Constitution is colorblind. I never said the society was colorblind. We're talking about what the Constitution says. The Constitution is our framing document. It's been forged through the second founding of the Republic, which was the Civil War, Lincoln, the post-war amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the reckoning with slavery a very concrete historical reality of the shaping of American culture and law. Slavery, the legal ownership of persons. They happen to be Negroes, Blacks, African-descended peoples. That's what the court was talking about when it framed the 14th Amendment. And when it said the law, uh, interpreted through uh, subsequent Supreme Court decisions and so on, is colorblind, that's what he means. It, it's in no way a sociological claim. And yet Justice Jackson's rebuttal and Sotomayor's rebuttal to the majority opinion is saying, how can you say that the Constitution is colorblind when the society is so race uh, conscious and race imbued? Um, and un unstated there, I think, is, an, uh, is necessary to make their argument work is the claim that further, 
of course, everyone's going to have to concede that the society is racially tinged, that the law should be adapted in such a manner as to remedy or confront that racial uh, reality. That's where uh, Roberts and Thomas are saying, no, it shouldn't. We're going by the uh, original understanding of the framers on their reading of the framers. And we're protecting the law, the Constitution. We're not trying to fix the society. We're trying to protect and interpret the framework that's going to guide us because the 21st century is going to bring new challenges to our republic, like all those Asian students queuing up to get into the best schools in the country, the way the Jews were doing 100 years ago. And we're going forward into the 21st century. Uh, we need a framework of law suitable to the uh, mission of, you know, pre preserving America's uh, institutions and so on. So, I, you know, anyway, that's how I see it. I'm sitting here just getting angry listening. Because I, do Justices Jackson and Sotomayor, especially those two, because they are people of color, do they not understand that acknowledging that society is not colorblind does not require or still requires us to question things like our current situation where calling yourself acknowledging racism means that, first of all, university presidents quietly think that Jewish students should be able to put up with practically being tortured on campus because they're white, whereas the minute anybody says even the slightly accurate thing to a black student or somebody, you know, colors in Beethoven's face, you know, brown as a prank or something like that, then there has to be a whole teach-in and somebody might get expelled or suspended and, and we have to talk about how you know, this will not be tolerated, etc. White Jewish students, supposedly to be Jewish is to be white, as opposed to protecting black people. Isn't there something wrong with the idea that Jewish students should be required to just put up with something that we so carefully shield black and Latino students from? And then that leads to it becoming clear that, say, Harvard, the president of Harvard, Harvard University, is somebody who has not rich academic experience in terms of her record and doesn't have a rich administrative record either and was clearly chosen because she is brown and, and good in a room. Is that what we need to do? For those two to pretend that there aren't serious excesses, when you look at the aggregate of things like that, you start thinking that those cold-hearted notions that, for example, Clarence Thomas is espousing might have some merit. I sometimes find myself guiltily thinking we have to be that cold about it, or maybe we should, because otherwise what we get is the vast and dehumanizing overstretches, such as the ones that it seems to me that our two brown justices, who are not Thomas, pretend don't exist or somehow don't mind. I don't find that wise of them, that particular tendency to think of societal racism in that way. It, it, it angers me. They don't see the excess or they think that the excess is tolerable when the excess is insulting to brown people, not, not uplifting. <clears throat> God. And it's also discriminatory against the Asians, uh, that too. which we wouldn't want to lose track of. They, those people are people too. <laughs> they are Americans too. The law is there to protect them just as much as anybody else. But of course, don't you know they're, they're discriminating really discriminating against them. They're really white. <laughs> this is what we're supposed to think. Yeah, they're people. Ugh. Yeah. I, I really, now, I have, I am really disturbed by the way Asians are dismissed by this whole way of thinking that they're just not supposed to matter. They don't have real problems. That's really not right. Has it been right for 25 years? Anyway, what were you saying? No, I, I'm, that was worth hearing. Now I was going to offer a, a cautionary note on the colorblindness theme which is, and, and I actually wrote a, a letter to Coleman uh, about this because it's something I, I bring up with my students all the time. I say, okay, we don't think people should be treated any differently as individuals based upon the race. The race of a person ought not to be something that, you know, leads us to deal with them in one way or another. 
Let me suppose I agree with that. Let me stipulate that. Does it follow from that, that a pattern of racial inequality is something that we should pay no particular attention to in society? So if I have jails, and if I notice that Blacks are half the people in the jails, but only one-eighth of the people in the society, should that raise my eyebrow at all? If I have a recession, and I notice that the Black community is going to be especially hard hit because their employment positions are marginal, should I take that on board when I'm thinking about how to fight the recession? Um, if I had infant mortality rates that were for women giving birth, wildly disparate by race, should I take that under consideration when I'm doing my public health uh, policies? Uh, if, if I have uh, huge differences in the test scores presented by students who are competing to get into selective institutions of education, do I have a problem in virtue of the racial disparity? Now, we can answer those questions yes or no, but that's, those are different questions from the question of whether or not an individual should be treated uh, without regard to their particular racial identity. And I fear that the colorblindness uh, fetishization, which I detect in some of this uh, uh, argument for colorblind America, fails to draw that distinction. And in fact, leads to a matter of indifference about patterns of racial inequality because it is thought to pay attention to the racial dimension of a social malady is somehow to not be colorblind. And, and I, I just think that needs to be argued for. And, it, you know, race indifference and race blindness, they're not the same thing. Blindness is I take the, the box off the form so I don't know when I make the decision about an individual. But indifference is I don't shape my program in policy mindful of the likely consequences uh, in terms of these disparities, because after all, race doesn't matter. That second claim is a much stronger and I think weak, I mean, much weaker claim. It's a much more substantive moral claim than the former. I completely agree. For many people, though, as far as they're concerned, there are people who think that Black people's problems are just Black people's fault. If Black people don't try hard enough, and that it's time to give up on trying to change things. And for people like that, the colorblindness argument is attractive because that would be a very appropriate stance to take if that's what you thought. I frankly think, I don't think it's slanderous of me to say this, that that's what your friend Amy Wax thinks. And so colorblindness is really just the way we should go. I think that it is... I don't think it's inaccurate to say that that's what Charles Murray and Richard Ernstein were saying in that one sliver of the bell curve. I think Murray has kind of retreated on it somewhat since, um, but that's what they meant. And if that's where you want to go, okay, but most of us don't. So yeah, the question is, to what extent did racism create some sort of disparity? Now, of course, where it tends to go, and this is equally frustrating, is exaggerating the extent to which it was racism and making racism this kind of magic mojo. But there are cases where historical situations have created disparities that persist today and there are changes that we could make with race in mind that would create justice. The hard thing is deciding which of those things there are. The sad thing about post-2020 is that there's like a gun at everybody's head where we're supposed to pretend that racism is everything at all times. That's extremely unsuitable. But I can't go in the other direction either. Colorblindness is a term that doesn't make that easy. Yeah. That's that's the problem. I would think we might need a new term um, that would then you know, become used unclearly as well. But yeah, it's just an awkward word, basically. Yeah, I'm I'm smiling to myself here because I'm remembering a conversation I had with the late great Stanley Crouch. This would have been in the '90s. I was at Boston University, and I had started a, a research center called the Institute on Race and Social Division, which I was director of. It had a good run, six, seven years. I could go into it, but that would be uh, taking us off track. The bottom line is, Stanley writes me uh, sometime after I had just gotten started. And he says, "Yeah, hey, man, I hear you got a race institute up there. Don't you know that race is over?" He would have said that. Yeah. <laughs> Race is over, brother. <laughs> meaning, meaning, 
it's time for us to be orienting ourselves as uh, American intellectuals in the spirit of Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison and so forth, who were heroes of Stanley Crouch's toward a sensibility that is humanistic and transracial and not so parochial and, you know, so on that as we open ourselves to the, uh, to the fullness of our human potential as African Americans, we, you know, wear it lightly, not so heavily, what not racism. I, I, it makes me smile every time I think about that. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of people are saying that now, certainly in the comment section, whenever I give a defense of any kind of racial justice take, uh, whatsoever, the comments will say, so many of them will say, who cares? I'm tired of you blacks belly aching. You're just excuse making. You're just excuse making. Let's move on. You know, you live in the 19th century, talk about slavery all the time because the 21st century is just too tough. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not without sympathy for that idea when I tell black people nobody is coming to save us. It's time to get busy because, you know, the world is changing. It's, it's moving very fast. But when I hear it coming <laughs> from your typical uh, Af uh, white American uh, observer, it sends a chill up my spine. Yeah. The clock is ticking on the race, uh, structural racism, race belly aching, I demand reparations argument. You know, the clock is ticking on it. You know, though, I don't know if it is. Because of what happened with 2020, it pushed the, the, the clock backwards a little bit. Like, one thing that we're going to have to deal yeah. with more is reparations, much to my surprise, are kind of happening. And as I said on this show, I'm not going to just say no, 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 if that's the way it goes. If, if they're coming, then I think one has to take a different, a different orientation. But, you know, Stanley, I wish he had lived longer. I wish he had been a little healthier because he was. I always talk about various things that turned me, so to speak, and made me start standing athwart what I was taught as the wisdom on civil rights and racism. He was one of them. When I read a book of his essays, yeah. I thought, wait a minute, this, you know, he's, I, I'll bet it. I'll bet it was Notes of a Hanging Judge. No, it was the All-American Skin Game. Um, Aha. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah, that, and yeah. I just thought, this is somebody he is, you know, proudly, openly, and expertly Black. So he's not, you know, somebody, some bow-tied person way off somewhere. And yet, he is a humanist. He is in the tradition of, say, Ellison. And he could knock down anybody who came at him with criticism, unfortunately, physically, once or twice, but he he was the real deal. He was where things need to go. There's a line between him and, well, I'm not going to put it that way, but Coleman and also Tyler Austin Harper promised to be him, I think. But I wish he were still around to kind of shoot the ship because he, he never really did podcast culture. He didn't make it that long. He would have been excellent in the way we talk to each other now. I really, he used to call me late at night sometimes. I really, I yeah. thought he was really special in that way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, it should be mentioned that he was a fabulous jazz critic writing for the Village Voice and other places, that he and the great jazz trumpeter Wynton Marcellus were uh, behind the forces behind jazz at the Lincoln Center. Uh, he, he was an important, Stanley Crouch, an important figure in 20th century American culture. So there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How about we close on our favorite uh, topic of disagreement, which is Trump and Biden. <laughs> Not that I'm a Trump supporter. I don't want anyone to get me wrong out here, but I have, I have on occasion been a Trump defender in conversation with John McWhorter and we could, you could just go into the archives and see. But uh, the question has arisen as to whether or not there should be a debate. It is obvious that Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. Biden's going to be the Democratic nominee. We're going to have a presidential election in November. And uh, typically, there are debates organized between the con con major contending candidates. And um, how, how do you uh, react to the question of whether or not there should be uh, debates? Or at least one. If the debates are supposed to be about the issues, if we're dealing with, say, Nixon versus Kennedy, which candidate has the most attractive ideas to you about the issues? And maybe to an extent, which candidate is 
mentally alert in a way that he is good at carrying what the other person says. In other words, a, a debate. Now, there's always some showbiz involved, the Nixon-Kennedy debates being, you know, a classic example of how you thought Nixon won if you just heard it, you thought Kennedy won. Oh, yeah. So that there's always going to be some of that, sure. But Because Nixon was sweating. Yeah. And less handsome, but he also <laughs> used his sweating. He didn't have the right makeup. But in this case, and I guess I'm going to seem like I'm beating a dead horse, but I genuinely feel Trump is not capable of engaging in what we would call a debate. I don't mean that he's too stupid to... Well, yes, yeah. I do, but <laughs> I do think he's not smart enough to grasp the juice. But more to the point, he won't engage in debate in that way. All he's going to do is beat his chest and war and do that thing that he does. He can't debate. So we can call it a debate, but all it'll be is Biden trying to make his points and the other person just roaring and screaming and ridiculing and name calling. That's not a debate. I would rather that Biden do some nice town halls by himself and Trump keep doing his rallies. Why bring them together? Especially given that the nature of things is such that it's going to sway so very, very few people. And yes, I'll admit that there's an extent because the show is that to the extent that anybody swayed, it'll be by Trump because he's funny and a little more vital seeming at his age than Biden is. But mainly, Trump can't do the thing we call debate. All it'll be is a show. Why do it? I just don't, I'm not sure I see the reason to put them on the same stage. But you do? Well, I think that people are entitled to see their uh, prospective uh, uh, presidents uh, comport themselves in public in response to questions. And by the way, it's not just the two people there, there are also the journalists who are putting the questions to the candidates. The, the quote-unquote debate does involve some back and forth, but it also involves some between the, uh, uh, with the journalist as intermediary between the candidate and the audience. Explain yourself. Explain yourself under pressure. Explain yourself with, w when there's a rebuttal that's coming back uh, at you from the other side. Tell me why what you believe is what it is that I should endorse. And so I, you know, but Trump can't do I that. Think, well, in which case he won't answer the question. He'll just roar and perform. And call he, 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 he will sh he will show himself to be if that's what he does. Precisely that someone who doesn't answer the questions. We should have the opportunity to put the questions to him and to have him respond to the uh, arguments that are made by the other side and vice versa. And if he doesn't do it, then he will have failed. I mean, this is we're back to this. You really don't trust the people to glean from such an encounter the messages that they should glean. You, you think that they're going to be duped or take it yeah, enough yeah. to affect like this the outcome, of the election. outcome that we have. Yeah. 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 More to the point, though. And it feels, it's, it sounds, I mean, given that Biden is feeble, uh, that State of the Union was forcefully delivered, but the general problem of Biden walking across the White House lawn to get to Marine One helicopter to take him someplace. And you have to hold your breath wondering whether he's going to stumble along the way is a real problem. I want the, uh, I'm going to take such a drubbing in the comments section, but I want to make it clear. My main reason for not wanting the debate is not that I'm worried that people would be swayed and that he would he would win because I don't think people understand the issues, etc. I mean, let's face it. We've all always known that most people don't follow politics closely. That is true, but that's not my main reason. My main reason for it is just thinking Trump is incapable of answering questions. Trump is incapable of actual debate. What's the point? And then I find also myself worried about how close the election is, et cetera. Anyway, go, go ahead. No, I think we've exhausted the topic here. Uh, I, I, I was just going to say, in, in virtue of Biden's limitations, associated with his age, it's very clear why his campaign would want to avoid debates be because they are a, pit a minefield uh, for them. Some could go wrong. Anything could go wrong. And why take that risk? It, there's very little to gain and there's a lot to lose. And it's also clear why Trump would want debates because he wants to overpower. Uh, 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 yeah, you know, and, and show I, I'm, I'm the better man. I'm more vital. I'm, I'm, I'm faster on my feet. I'm, you know, whatever. Yeah, when uh, Biden, so, Biden wouldn't have the control that he had over the State of the Union speech, and he would be more likely to either slip and say some, say something stupid, or severely misremember something, and then it would be endlessly played. You have to do this three times. Yeah, 
that's not something I've been thinking that hard about. But yeah, it would not be good for Biden. I put it this way. If Biden gave more press conferences, I'd see less of a need for a debate. <laughs> if, if he opened himself to spontaneously reacting to aggressive questioning from the public, the media are just our representatives, then I'd say, okay, that purpose has been served. Uh, we don't have to have uh, a, a contest between these two candidates. But absent that, he wants to campaign, so to speak, from his basement. Yeah. So you wouldn't think it was I, I think the people are poorly served. How would you feel about him doing three events of that kind where he had to hold his own live for two hours? And he has to do that, say, every 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 two weeks. Would that be a decent substitute for getting on stage yeah. with Trump? Yeah, it would. Now I think we, uh, from my point of view, have, now we've written a column. I think I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'm gonna, okay, you could just mention I'll me in you, a footnote. I know they don't do footnotes on columns. I will, I will give uh, as you, my friend Glenn Lowry in our wonderful <laughs> podcast, The Glenn Show. <laughs> I will give you credit. Yeah. Thank you. All right, my friend. Uh, I will see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, and I appreciate your time. Good talk. Sorry to you. again about the sound, folks. And Glenn, have a good one. Oh, and let me apologize for eating my breakfast <laughs> uh, while the first half of this conversation <laughs> ensued. But I needed to put something on my stomach. I'm taking medications over here. I had to put food on my stomach. <laughs> okay. Take okay, care. See you soon.